Ikrar, please start. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Hmm. Yes, set two minutes, one to two minutes, please. Okay. Assalamualaikum sir. Can we start now? Uh, yes, please. From my side, uh, ask from Vikram. Uh, sir Vikram, can we start now? Yes, yes, please. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Ikrar Ali, a fellow in neonatology at Indus Hospital uh, and Health Network, Karachi. Uh, today, we are uh, gathered here to discuss uh, the topic of our discussion is pattern ectus arteriosus. In your next. Uh, today, our two worthy uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Sajad Rahman and Dr. Zahir Rahman. Uh, Dr. Sajad Rahman is a consultant neonatologist, clinical director of NISU, uh, director of neonatal fellowship program, and chairman's research committee at Maternity and Child Hospital at Qasim, Saudi Arabia. And Dr. Zahir Rahman is consultant pediatric cardiologist, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. Uh, Jada, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Sir Sajad, it's over to you. You can start. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Bismillah and thank you for arranging this uh, very good uh, session, uh, Vikram and Ikrar and the whole industry. So let's get on to this uh, subject, whether you call it patent ductus arteriosus or persistent ductus arteriosus. So two different names for the uh, same thing. And we are going to work on this session. So let me just see if my slide is not moving. So today, me and uh, Dr. Zahir are jointly going to present uh, this uh, topic, uh, 15 minutes each. In the beginning, I'll just give you a bit of background from the neonatology point of view about the persistent ductus process. And then Dr. Zahir will give us the echo diagnosis of PDA and the hemodynamically significant ductus arteriosus. And then I will come for another 15 minutes to discuss about the pharmacologic treatment of the ductus arteriosus, patent ductus arteriosus. And then uh, uh, Dr. Zahir will finish by presenting the international and surgical treatment. So let's go to the uh, background and we have to see the fetal life and the fetal circulation. During fetal life, uh, there are two uh, shocks. The fetal circulation is a circulation in series. It is not a parallel circulation. Postnatal circulation is a parallel circulation. There is a pulmonary circulation and there is a systemic circulation with no communication between them directly. So there are two parallel circulations. But in the, in the fetal life, both the circulations are in, uh, in series because the lungs are not functioning. There is no breathing function. Lungs are collapsed. And therefore, all the blood coming from the right side of the heart has got to be shunted to the left side. So there are two shunts in the fetal circulation. One is the venous shunt, what we call the ductus venosus. It is on the venous side. And in the fetus, the venous side contains the oxygenated blood coming from the placenta and then going to the uh, right side of the heart. The, there is an, an arterial shunt as well, and that's called the ductus arteriosus. And that ductus arteriosus shunts the deoxygenated blood coming from the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery. It shunts it into the descending aorta, and then it goes back to the uh, placenta for oxygenation. 
both ductus venosus and ductus arteriosus are crucial for the survival of the fetus. If any of these two ducts closes during fetal circulation, the fetal circulation will stop and the fetus is likely to die. But that is the fetal circulation. After birth, this fetal circulation changes into neonatal circulation and there is a small period of what we call the transitional circulation. So this uh, circulation, which happens after the fetal life and what we call the patent ductus arteriosus, if the ductus arteriosus, if normally the ductus arteriosus is supposed to close and the same is with the ductus venosus as well. Both of them close after the birth. But if it remains uh, open after the, uh, after the birth, then it becomes a, a, a problem. And that's what we call the patent ductus arteriosus. In the fetal life, the, the circulation is from right to left side. The pulmonary blood pressure is quite high. It is suprasystemic, and therefore all the blood going into the pulmonary artery is shunted through the ductus arteriosus into the descending artery. But after birth, when the lungs open and the pulmonary uh, blood vessels dilate, the pulmonary blood pressure goes down and it becomes subsystemic. And therefore, the, the, the flow through the ductus arteriosus also reverses. So after, after the birth, the pulmonary blood pressure is lower than the systemic blood pressure. And therefore, there is shunting of the blood from the aorta into the pulmonary arteries, both during systole as well as during, during diastole. This is how it looks anatomically. This is the main pulmonary artery. And this is the aorta. This is the aorta. This is the main pulmonary artery. And this is the left pulmonary artery. It is connected through the ductus arteriosus with the, with the descending aorta. Now, as I have said, the circulation uh, reverses after birth. During fetal life, there is right to left circulation, which is normal through the ductus arteriosus. After birth, the duct should close, and if it does not close, then this, the, the blood flows from the left side to the right side. This is the left side, which is the aorta, and this is the right side, which is the pulmonary circulation. So it flows into the uh, pulmonary circulation, both during systole and during diastole. And that's how it looks on the uh, echo, and Dr. Zahir is going to talk about it in, the, in detail. This is the... Uh, right pulmonary artery, the left pulmonary artery, this is the main pulmonary artery, and this is the ductus arteriosus with left to right shunt. This is the classical ductal view, uh, the, the, the short axis view, left parasternal view. And Dr. Zahir will talk about it in detail. Now, what happens physiologically during transitional circulation? During transitional circulation, the uh, duct gradually closes, and this closure of the duct is a normal phenomenon. It varies from the term babies to preterm babies and extremely preterm babies, how the duct behaves. The structure of the wall of the ductus arteriosus is different in full-term babies as well as in preterm babies. In full-term babies, the muscle in the wall, the tunica media in the wall of the ductus arteriosus is very well developed. While in preterm babies, it is not very well developed, and more preterm is the baby, uh, more less well developed is the, is the muscle. Now, how the duct remains open in fetal life? It remains open in fetal life because of the production of prostaglandin by the, by the epithelial cells and the, of the, of the ductus, and that keeps the duct open. After birth, the duct closes because the oxygenation of the blood improves and there's higher pure 2 and oxygen is the best uh, agent to close the, the ductus arteriosus. The response of the arterial muscle in the wall of the ductus arteriosus is different in term baby and preterm baby. Therefore, it's a mature response in term babies. So in full term babies, the ductus closes in 50% of the babies within the first 24 hour life. And this closure is actually a functional closure, not anatomical closure. So functionally, it closes within 24 hours in 50% of the babies. In 90%, in it closes in about 48 hours. And by, the, by 72 hours, it is closed in almost 100% of the babies. Therefore, 
persistent ductus arteriosus is not a big problem in full term babies. If it continues to remain open in a full term baby, then that is a that's an uh, indication that there is a defect in the wall of the ductus arteriosus. The muscle in the wall of the ductus arteriosus has got some kind of problem and it is non responsive to the normal stimuli. We should close the ductus arteriosus. Now, as you go down and look into the preterm babies, the bigger preterm babies, those who are more than 30 weeks in gestation, are say more than 1.5 kg in weight. About 90% of the ductus will close by day four of life, and 11% can remain open. And in extremely premature babies, less than 30 weeks, particularly those who are less than 28 weeks and less than one kg, up to 65% of the ductus can remain open, and this can produce hemodynamic problems and can have a lot of issues, which I'm going to discuss very shortly. Now, this is the incidence gestational age. So, duct is more of a problem in premature babies. If you look on the babies on this side of the, of the slide, babies who are less than 28 weeks, a lot of the babies will have their duct open on day three, day four, and day five of life. And as the gestational age advances, we can see that the, that the duct starts closing in more and more number of babies. In the, in the spontaneous closure happens more in the bigger babies who are more than 33 weeks. And spontaneous closure is less likely in babies who are preterm and more is the prematurity, more is the likelihood of spontaneous closure. This is a uh, little bit older study, but gives a very good epidemiologic data. The question is, if the duct remains open, then why we are worried about it? What problems it creates for us? So whether the duct closes spontaneously or the duct does not close spontaneously, this epidemiologic study from our colleagues from Qatar, it explains it very nicely. These are the babies in whom the duct closes spontaneously. And if you compare it with those babies in whom it does not close spontaneously, we can see the mortality is much higher and that is statistically significant. So it's more, there's more mortality in babies in whom the duct does not close spontaneously, which means persistent ductus arteriosus is associated with higher mortality. Not only that, but if you look on the morbidities, whether that is the chronic lung disease, intraventricular hemorrhage, necrotizing enterocolitis, or retinopathy of prematurity. It's more in all those babies in whom the duct does not close spontaneously. And this is all statistically significant. So which means that a persistent duct in a preterm babies, and particularly in extreme preterm babies, is a risk factor both for mortality as well as for morbidity. So it is not only the duct itself, but the size of the duct also matters. In a few slides later, I will explain what is a small uh, duct and what is a moderate duct and what is a large duct. But if you compare, and the study has compared, the small and moderate duct with the, with the large duct. So the mortality is higher in those babies in whom the duct is large, as compared to babies in whom the duct is small and moderate. This is a little bit old study, as I said previously, and at that time, people were not using the criteria to categorized duct as hemodynamically significant or hemodynamically insignificant. Similarly, if you look at the morbidity, other than just chronic lung disease, the incidence of intraventricular hemorrhage and the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis and ROP is much more in ducts which is larger as compared to the ducts which are small or moderate. So it means the size of the duct and hemodynamic, hemodynamic significance of the duct also matters and Larger duct, more hemodynamically significant duct leads to more uh, mortality and mortality. Now, this is about the size of the duct. So, the duct is usually measured by the, uh, by the echo and it's a normal function with the. Uh, Okay. So size of the duct, we usually divide it into three. And we measure it by the echo by using what we call the left parastomia short access window, also called the ductal window. A duct which is less than 1.5 millimeter is small. And usually we do not treat small duct because they are not significant otherwise. 
We usually treat the duct which is either moderate or large. And a moderate duct is defined as a duct which is 1.5 to 3 millimeter in size, and a large duct which is more than 3 millimeter size. Sometimes it can be more than uh, 4 millimeter, and we call it very large duct. So again, going back to the uh, size of the duct and the uh, modality of treatment, we see the total number of patients which this study had uh, uh, given. And we can see that in, in, the, in the small ducts, rarely we need pharmacotherapy, almost 94% close spontaneously. So this is not something which we clinically think is significant. Only moderate and large duct is, is clinically significant. And we can see that in moderate, uh, majority will close by the uh, pharmacotherapy. Some will need the uh, surgical closure. But in the large duct, again, majority will close with the pharmacologic treatment, and some will need the uh, surgical treatment. The recent data is, is a little bit more different than this one. Nowadays, the surgical intervention is required in much less number of babies because of better perinatal management and better. Uh, fluid and the ventilation management, and also because of the better uh, ways we give the therapy. So the question is, when should we treat the duct? The duct is a problem. It is a risk factor for mortality as well as for morbidity. And so when should we treat it? We should treat it only when the duct is hemodynamically significant. So then what is a hemodynamically significant duct? It's arterial access, HSPDA. Well, there are a number of uh, publications about this, starting from the publication of Nick Namara from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. He initially described what is HSPDA. And there are a number of publications which give different kinds of criteria to label it of HSPDA. And Zahid is going to explain this. But there is no international consensus on what constitutes a hemodynamically significant patent process. From a neonatology point of view, what we say is that we have to have a holistic approach to determine the hemodynamic significance. Therefore, we have to consider a lot of factors. These factors include the antenatal factors, including growth restriction, preeclampsia, maternal diabetes, antenatal steroids, and magnesium sulfate, and neonatal factors, including inotropic support, subfectant administration, invasive ventilation, hydration status, gestational age, and per rate of the, of the babies. So we have to consider these one. The other area which we need to consider is whether the duct is producing systemic hypotension or not, or systemic hypoperfusion of it. Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, you are big. You are big. You are big. Is it okay? Yes, yes. Please share your screen. Okay. You can see the screen. I'm almost done. So, you can see the screen. Hello? Yes, sir. The screen is not visible. Let me, let me, let me just... Is that okay now? Hello? Yes. It's visible now? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. 
So this was the last slide of my uh, first part to, to, to present. Okay. And the next will be Dr. Zahir. He will uh, take us through the echo diagnosis of PDA and HS, uh, Dr. Sardiosis. Dr. Zahir, so over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yes, I think I should stop sharing my screen. Yes, that's fine. Okay, so can you guys see my slides now? Yes, yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, right. So in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'm just going to go uh, briefly over the echocardiographic diagnosis. Uh, in, in hemodynamically significant PDA. Just a couple of uh, quick uh, disclaimer that uh, always you need to remember that echocardiographic diagnosis should be used in conjunction with clinical factors. And uh, sometimes the hemodynamic significance of PDA might not be directly related to the size, but depends upon the magnitude of the shunt and the ability of the premature myocardium to adapt to this uh, left right shunt. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, every neonate might behave differently with the same sort of hemodynamic information which you might get from, echo, from an echocardiogram. So that's why it's, it's, a, it's like a supplementary material, to be honest. So in terms of uh, whenever uh, you request an echo uh, for or no matter what, whether it's just a screening echo for, an, uh, for a PDA, uh, I firmly believe that the first echo needs to be a detailed echo and uh, preferably to be done by a pediatric cardiologist because uh, it's very important that you differentiate between a pathological and supportive role of the ductus during the transitioning phase. Then also sometimes there might be important ductal dependent structural heart diseases. And you, uh, in those cases, uh, the presence of ductus might be very important, for example, the dependent systemic circulation when we talk about uh, critical aortic stenosis, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, uh, uh, severe co-optation of aorta, or for that matter, duct-dependent pulmonary circulation, uh, for example, in pulmonary atresia. So it's very important to exclude all the uh, things. And also, you need to make sure that uh, you are not dealing with a case of persistent pulmonary hypertension of newborn in the presence of a large patent ductus arteriosus. So what are the echocardiographic parameters uh, which we are primarily interested when we are assessing uh, patent ductus arteriosus? It is uh, the PDA shunt and size, extent of volume overload, the degree of pulmonary overflow, magnitude of systemic hypoperfusion, and myocardial function. So I'll just go through them one by one now. So when I talk about the uh, size of the patent ductus arteriosus, usually it is measured at the narrowest point uh, for, for the PDA. For example, in, in this view, you can see there's a, there's a ductus arteriosus, which is shunting purely left, right. You could see the red jet going into the pulmonary arch from the aorta. And in the other picture, we have measured that at the narrowest point, uh, which measures around 0.26 uh, uh, centimeters or 2.6 millimeters. Okay, uh, so always remember to measure it at the narrowest point. And sometimes when you measure it uh, on the color, you might uh, overestimate the size. So that's why it's important to do two or three independent measurements to get the best feel of the, of the size. Next is, what is the direction of shunt across this ductus arteriosus? Primarily, there are three sorts of uh, flow pattern which you could recognize first, or the most common is a left to right shunt. And then if, when we talk about pure left to right shunt, then we need to see whether it's a non-restrictive shunt, which classically have a low peak systolic velocity, or it's a high velocity shunt, which shows the restrictiveness of the duct. Then it could be a bi-directional flow, or if it is purely right to left, that's where you should be alarmed about the pathologic nature of this patent ductus arteriosus in terms of excluding any significant congenital cardiac defects or persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Um, let me show you a couple of clips. So here you could see that this, the patent ductus arteriosus, you could see this uh, red color flow, which is going into the pulmonary arteries. And you could see the branch pulmonary arteries, and this is the descending aorta down. So 
immediately you know that this is a, a patent ductus arteriosus which is shunting left to right. And an experienced eye probably might say that it is most likely going to be moderate to large without doing any measurements. On this occasion, here I'm showing you a pure blue flow, which, is, which means that it is shunting pure right to left. So you see the descending aorta below, and this is uh, the pulmonary, uh, this is the patent ductus arteriosus shunting right to left. Sometimes people can, uh, especially if you're inexperienced, you can, mix it, you can mix it as a flow from the left pulmonary artery. So you need to be always absolutely sure that you, that you do not um, miss a patent ductus arteriosus, which is purely shunting right to left and uh, reported as a, uh, as a left pulmonary artery flow. And it, it, it does in practical life. So when I talk about examples of different Doppler traces, uh, if you if you know from the hemodynamics, usually as Dr. Sajjad has mentioned that you uh, in the fetal life it's it's a it's a persist in a in a fetal circulation your pulmonary pressures are systemic or suprasystemic, and as time passes by, it, it your pulmonary pressures tends to go down. That's why you might say uh, might see a pure right to left shunt within few uh, first hours of life or maybe within first day or so. But as time passes by, it should go down to a bidirectional shunt and then essentially to the pure uh, left to right shunt. Here, uh, this is a classical example of a pure right to left shunt. You have done a Doppler in the pulmonary artery and everything is below, the, this systolic flow is below the baseline. That is pure right to left shunt. In bidirectional, bidirectional shunt, you see the flow is going in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, from left to right and then right to left. When we talk about pure left to right, the, uh, the flow is all above the baseline. This is a low, uh, low uh, uh, systolic velocity. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have the, uh, the scale over there, but, uh, and this is, if you see like a persi persistent flow with not much of dipping below, this is a classical uh, Doppler tracing of a restrictive patent ductus arteriosus. Then how do you evaluate pulmonary overcirculation? So, you, so normally what happens is that when there's increased pulmonary blood flow, it will lead to increased pulmonary venous return, which ultimately will lead to left atrial and left ventricular dilatation. So one of the, uh, one of the most uh, used uh, sort of uh, number is the ratio of left atrium to aorta. Usually, uh, you know, the aorta is, is kind of a constant structure, but as more and more blood flows to the, uh, come back to the pulp from the pulmonary veins to the left atrium, it's going to get dilated. And that's why it's, uh, the ratio is going to get uh, further and further high. And one magic number which, uh, which has been described is if it's more than 1.4, you probably will consider it as significant shunt. Also, when the more blood is going to the left atrium, ultimately it goes down to the left ventricle and that leads to increase in left ventricle and diastolic dimension. So, uh, that will, uh, so your left ventricle and diastolic dimension will also be increased. But you need to remember that this is not just a number, it needs to be indexed uh, to, the, to the body surface area and depending upon gestational age, there are different numbers. Which can be uh, uh, which can be correlated. Finally, uh, we still uh, uh, look at uh, there's a subjective assessment, what we call as eyeballing. Just by looking at the left ventricle, you can give a rough guesstimate of whether it's a volume loaded left heart or not. And I'll show you in the, in the example that how we do that. So here uh, you see in the first picture, you uh, you've seen uh, there's four chambers of the heart left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, and right ventricle. And uh, you don't see much of dilatation of the, of, the, of the left side of the heart. But in this picture, your heart is, uh, your left uh, ventricle is assuming more of a globular appearance. That for an experience, I will tell you that probably there is some volume loading. And if you look at the last image, like now you can clearly see that the left atrium and left ventricle are significantly dilated. Uh, and even interatrial septum, is going to the right side of the heart. So these are the classical signs of volume overloading of the left side of the heart. Additionally, if you, if you see some degree of mitral regurgitation, here you see this blue flow, which is going back from the, from the mitral valve. This is mitral regurgitation. Uh, so all the, collected all the information together, you can say that this is a, uh, this is a really volume loaded the left side of the heart, the suggestive of uh, a significant patent ductus arteriosus. Then as, it, as we talked about uh, the left atrium to aorta ratio, this is the left atrium, which is at the bottom, and this is the aorta. This is a, a peristernal long axis view. 
So, so we have cut to the ascending aorta and the left atrium, and you see the ratio is, uh, is more than two. Again, signifying the uh, dilatation of the left heart, side of the heart, which indirectly may, uh, tells you that there is significant pulmonary overcirculation. Then the people also look at uh, some other parameters. Uh, I must say that uh, routinely we don't look at them, but if you really uh, want to get more and more numbers in your favor, then you can look at the presence of forward pulmonary flow in diastole. Usually what happens is that in, in, uh, in, the, in the branch pulmonary arteries, there's no forward flow in the diastole. As in this picture, you see, you could see a Doppler trace which finishes here, another Doppler trace which finishes here. But if you have a forward flow, it will be more like a continuous flow, which is going to the diastole. And if it is more than 20 centimeters per second, and that is described as a marker of increased pulmonary blood flow. Then uh, people also look at the mitral valve EA ratio. If it's more, it is more, usually uh, this is more of an adult type of pattern, which is not present in, in the premature newness because of uh, their diastolic dysfunction. Usually your E wave is smaller than the A wave, but here it's, uh, it's more like an, an adult pattern, which is suggestive of uh, hemodynamic significant uh, PDA. Then more and more numbers, if you want to do, you can do left ventricular output. Uh, I mean, we don't have time to explain in details, but normal values are 150 to 300 ml per kg. And in a significant PDA, it can go up to even 400 to 600 ml per kg. Uh, finally, uh, you have to, uh, once you have decided that there is a significant pulmonary overcirculation, another indicator is systemic hypoperfusion. And how do you, how do you look at systemic hypoperfusion is looking at, you can do some Dopplers in the descending aorta. And usually what happens is that uh, this is a Doppler from the descending aorta, just below the patent ductus arteriosus. And you see this flow, which is mainly in the systole and there's some flow in the diaphragm. But uh, if this patent ductus arteriosus is significant, you see, you see this retrograde flow in the diaphragm. So if you see this retrograde diastolic blood flow, it is highly suggestive of significant transductal shunt volume. And uh, indirectly, it might suggest that there's system, system, uh, there is significant systemic hypoperfusion. Finally, uh, always remember uh, to uh, uh, look at the LV function. One important thing which I want to mention in, in terms of left ventricle function is that as your left ventricle starts to dilate, it becomes hyperdynamic. So, uh, for example, if you do their uh, ejection fraction or fractional shortening, they will be super normal. So if you, if you see a significant patent ductus arteriosus by all numbers and your function is just normal or below normal, you should be really worried that your left ventricle has started to, uh, uh, started to fail. And probably that's uh, indirectly should be an indication for early intervention. Otherwise, it will lead to further decompensation of your left ventricle function. Uh, these are uh, these are just, uh, most uh, just like a summary of whatever I have I've spoken about. That uh, you look look at the ductal characteristics: PDA size small, less than 1.5, moderate 1.5 to 2, or uh, if it's more than 2, it's it's really large duct. And then we already talked about the uh, LA aortic ratio or LV and diastolic dimensions, and finally retrograde or absent blood flow during diastole. So it is just kind of a recap. Uh, as I said, uh, there are papers which have tried to uh, do some uh, uh, patent ductus arteriosus uh, se uh, severity scoring systems, and they try to get as many information as they can get, and then they can uh, uh, they can put these numbers to see whether it, could, uh, it is a small, moderate, or large gap. Uh, this is an interesting thing which I found uh, in, in, in on one of the websi websites, which is uh, run by essentially by the pneumatologist who have a special interest in, uh, in ultrasound, point of care ultrasound. And they have come up with a calculator with, with, named as PDA calculator. So if you, if you get an echocardiogram, which is done either by an echocardiogra uh, echocardiographer, pediatric cardiologist, or a neurologist, and if you have like a sheet to see what numbers you get, like PDA diameter, left pulmonary diameter, PDA velocity, uh, LA aortic ratio, EA ratio, and then uh, uh, as we mentioned about the diastolic flows, you, uh, it will come up with a result that will probably give you some idea of the significance of the patent ductus arteriosus. For example, I just put some random numbers. 
Uh, for example, I put a PDA diameter of two millimeters, PLPA 2.5, uh, 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 velocity which was less than two centimeters per second and other numbers, and it, it came up with the result that it's probably a moderate patent ductus arteriosus with moderate significant pulmonary overcirculation and a moderate systemic hypoperfusion. Overall, a moderate shunt. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that it will change your management entirely, but at least it can act as a rough guide and if, especially if you're doing some serial echocardiograms, you will get an idea about the trend which way uh, the, uh, your patient is going and whether you have to alter your management. Uh, then people have also talked about echocardiography as a predictive tool. And there was a paper which mentioned about that if you look at the ductal monotony and if a ductal length is less than 5.2 millimeters uh, within the first 72 hours of a life, it's, it's, just, it's just predictive of a hemodynamically significant PDA with a, with a reasonable sensitivity and specificity, specificity I would say. Then uh, there are some like uh, you can uh, there's with scoring system you can predict the outcome. Uh, let's not go into details of that. So this is again just a summary that uh, you you get all the all the measurements which we talked about, and then, then you can uh, you can uh, divide your patent arteriosis into small, moderate, and large. Uh, just a, uh, just a minute or so. Uh, I think uh, the time has come where we need to have more immunologist-led echocardiography service. I know it's, it's, a, it's still a debate in our part of the world, but if you look at the Western world, they have adapted it nicely. And personally, I feel that immunologists can do a better job than a pediatric cardiologist because they are looking after that, child, uh, that unit day in, day out, and they know what information they need to get. And secondly, also, uh, if one person is doing an serial echocardiogram, there is less chance of having a, a drop observability abilities as well. So I think uh, probably we should uh, we should seriously think about training more and more people to do neonatal echocardiographies. These are just some of the papers which I which I uh, pulled out. So I think uh, in summary, echo is a very useful tool in assessing PDA. You need uh, uh, you need to optimize your image to have accurate measurements. And more importantly, information obtained needs to be put into the clinical context. And uh, now I'll, I'll hand it over back to Dr. Sajjad for the third part, and then I'll take over in, in the final. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Zahid. It was very uh, useful. And of course, we work as one single team with our cardiologist, and we agree with your uh, idea of uh, neonatologist led functional echo service. And that's what we're trying to build at the, at the moment. Okay, so let's go to the next part. The, that's the treatment of uh, PDA. As I said previously, we treat the duct only when it is hemodynamically significant. So how do we treat the uh, hemodynamically significant ductus arteriosus? Either we treat it pharmacologically or non pharmacologically. So the first uh, step is to treat the pharmacologically. So I will just take the first part, which is a pharmacologic treatment, which we as neonatologists do. And the second part, non pharmacologic treatment, is the area covered by the cardiologist. So Dr. Zahir will take uh, that part. Now, when we treat the duct, there are two approaches to it. One is that we treat the duct prophylactically and do not allow it to become hemodynamically significant. This was a concept which we practiced in 1990s and in early 2000s. And then there is a rescue treatment, which means we treat the duct only when it becomes hemodynamically significant. So the prophylactic treatment basically prevents the development of hemodynamically significant PDA. And this was a practice at some point where all extremely premature babies used to get uh, uh, medications which would stop the development of a significant duct. So the prophylactic treatment of PDA was being practiced by using the endomethacin, which was the most commonly used medicine after the trial of the, uh, of the medication run by Barbara Schmidt. And then some people also tried to close it uh, prophylactically by using ibuprofen. And there are small studies about the use of acetaminophen, which is paracetamol, and try to close it prophylactically with that. 
but by far and large that era of prophylactic treatment and prophylactic closure of PDA is now over. To my knowledge, probably nowadays nobody is closing the ductus arteriosus prophylactically uh, at the time of, of, of life. So what we normally do now is the, is the rescue treatment, which means first we assess the duct. If it has not closed spontaneously, and if it continues to persist, and if it becomes hemodynamically significant, which we assess exactly with the uh, cardiologist, and as we have discussed that uh, criteria, both myself and Dr. Zaid, then we uh, treat the uh, duct pharmacologically. As I said in the beginning, the duct is normally open because of prostaglandin produced within the bone of the uh, ductus arteriosus. So prostaglandin keeps the duct open. So any medication which decreases the production of prostaglandin will close the duct. So we use three kinds of medications, indomethacine, ibuprofen, and paracetamol. All these three are uh, anti-prostaglandin. They decrease the production of prostaglandin and therefore help in the closure of the duct. Indomethacine and ibuprofen are COX inhibitors, cyclooxygenase inhibitor medications. They are the same mechanism of action. But paracetamol has got a little bit different mechanism of action, and I'm going to come to that in a minute. So intermethacine, as I have said in the beginning, it is a prostaglandin inhibitor, and it blocks the production of prostaglandin by blocking the cyclooxygenase site of prostaglandin synthase enzyme. Therefore, arachidonic acid cannot be converted into uh, prostaglandin. And with that, the duct starts closing. Now, there are a number of uh, uh, problems with the uh, intermethacine. This was the first pharmacologic agent which was used for the closure of the duct, particularly in 1990s and the mid 200s. The, the, one of the big problems is that the intermethacine is a very strong vasoactive substance, which means we not only affect the muscle in the bone of the ductus arteriosus. It has a marked systemic vasoconstrictor effect, and that's what leads to a lot of problem. We basically want to give it only to close the uh, ductus arteriosus, but it also produces vasospasm in a large number of body organs. And those particularly affected are the kidneys, the gut, and the blood vessels in the brain. Therefore, the incidence of renal failure incidence of periventricular leukomalacia and incidence of metaphysic enterocolitis is very high with the use of intermethacine. And in fact, uh, when the intermethacine was being used prophylactically, there was a large number of cases of renal failure, NEC, and EVL reported for in babies who would otherwise not have all these problems. That's why the prophylactic use of intermethacine is not out of practice. It, is only, it was only used later as a rescue treatment and as we stand currently, even the intermethacine is not the first line of medication because it has been replaced by a more effective uh, uh, medication, which is the ibuprofen. I'm going to come to that in a moment. So intermethacine is very effective in closing the duct, but the safety remains an issue. Therefore, the people started moving to another much safer medication, which is as effective as is intermethacine, and that is ibuprofen. So ibuprofen is as effective as indomethacine, and it has less risk of systemic vasoconstriction. So less risk of kidney injury, less risk of necrotizing ventricolitis, and less risk of periventricular leukomalacia. So for all practical purposes, the era of using indomethacine as first-time medication to close PDA is now over. So next is ibuprofen. Again, this is a COX inhibitor, it's a prostaglandin inhibitor. It affects the cyclooxygenase site of the prostaglandin synthase enzyme. So arachidonic acid cannot be converted into uh, prostaglandin and the duct closes. Now, this is the first line of medication in, for, for most of the people even now. And it is given as a rescue therapy. The standard course of ibuprofen which we give is the three dose uh, medication. The first dose is 10 milligrams per kilogram per dose. Second is half of that, that's five milligrams. And the third is also half five milligram per kilogram per dose. Usually they are given at 24 hour interval, three doses, but some people do give them at 12 hourly intervals as well. Now ibuprofen can be given both orally as well as intravenously. 
and both oral and IV ibuprofen are uh, safe. Though there are a little bit of questions about the absorption of oral IV ibuprofen. Some people have introduced a new hard dose ibuprofen, which can be given IV and oral. This hard dose ibuprofen, uh, the first dose is 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram. The second dose is half of that, which will be 7.5 to 10 milligrams per kilogram. And the third dose will also be half dose, 7.5 to 10 milligrams. And you can give them at 24 hour intervals or at 12 hour intervals. And there are a number of studies published with the hard dose ibuprofen. So a high dose of oral ibuprofen was associated with a higher likelihood of hemodynamically significant PDA closure as compared to standard doses of intravenous ibuprofen or intravenous intermedicine. And this was a study published by Mitra et al. in 2018 in JAMA. Now the third medication is acetaminophen, which is now getting a little bit more popularity and becoming more into practice. This is also a prostaglandin inhibitor and it closes the duct by a, a little bit different mechanism. It does not affect the cyclooxygen as part of the enzyme. It affects the peroxidase section, peroxidase site of the prostaglandin synthase enzyme. But the ultimate effect is the same. That's the less production of prostaglandin and closure of the duct. Again, paracetamol can be given both IV as well as oral. The uh, drug has not been as extensively studied as uh, the COX inhibitors like indomethacine and ibuprofen. Most of the people believe that it is as effective as ibuprofen, and there is a lot of data to believe in that as well. But still, some people doubt about it because the, 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 num the number of trials done and the, and the data available is not very, very big. It is much safer as compared to the other two of the medications, the COX inhibitors. There's less renal insufficiency and uh, uh, there is less damage to the other targets when you know, compared to the uh, ibuprofen. And one of the important things is that the paracetamol for the closure of PDA has not yet been approved by the uh, FDA. So paracetamol, the common dose which we give is 15 milligrams per kilogram per dose every six hours. You can give it IV, you can give it oral. There is an alternative regime as well. And that is the loading dose. We give 20 milligrams per, per kilogram. And then a maintenance dose of 7.5 milligram per kilogram every uh, six hours. How long should we give the acetaminophen? Is still a question. There is nobody settled about it. And various styles have used it from as little as two days to as high as seven days. So it could be a very prolonged uh, uh, course. And most of the people who are giving, they monitor the closure of the duct by serial echography, like echocardiography. So every day echocardiography is done. And by that you determine whether two days enough or three days enough, and you should go for a total of, uh, of seven days. And the longer the duration, the more is the chance of hypertoxicity. And we know the hypertoxicity of paracetamol is something well known. So it has been less reported in babies uh, in whom it was used for the closure of the ductus arteriosus, unless the baby has an underlying liver problem. So the uh, acetaminophen has been compared to the other medications as, as well as to the placebos. There are small studies, uh, case series, but there are four big studies as well, which have compared acetaminophen with ibuprofen and etomethacine, both its for the safety and efficacy. I'm not going to go into the details of these uh, studies, but the overall uh, conclusion of these studies is that acetaminophen is as effective as NSAIDs. NSAIDs are the COX inhibitors, uh, intermethacine and uh, ibuprofen. So it's as effective as both of these for PDA lawyer with a lower incidence of clinically significant, significant adverse reactions. Now, every time we give the pharmacologic treatment, it's not 100% effective. So the treatment fails. So, but again, the question is, if you have given one course of one medication, suppose you have given one course of ibuprofen and the duct has not closed or still remains hemodynamically significant, what should be the next line of action? Should we give a second course of ibuprofen? Or uh, should we give a second course with acetaminophen? Or uh, we should give first course of acetaminophen that if it does not close, then we should give a second course with the ibuprofen. Or uh, should we give a second course or a third course with intermethacin to close? 
there is no data available. This varies with the individual practice of the, of the physicians. Some people like one way or the other way, and there is no, uh, there are no trials, there's no consensus, and there are no guidelines to say which practice is better and which practice is, is, is not better. It all depends upon the clinical guideline developed by the consultants in any, any single unit. However, whatever we do, whether we give single course or we do two courses or, or a third course, as some people do, if the duct still remains significant, hemodynamically significant, and we conclude that the duct has failed to close because of the uh, has, has, has not responded to the pharmacologic treatment at least has failed to close, then we go for the interventional or uh, surgical closure. And Dr. Zahir is going to take over that and uh, finish the session with the uh, international and surgical closure of the Dr. Sarbiosis. Dr. Zahir, over to you. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, so as Dr. Uh, Sajjad has mentioned about the medical management, so I will just uh, uh, in the next few minutes talk about a little bit about uh, other uh, other aspects of the management. Um, so from the, uh, from the cardiologist's point of view, what options uh, do we have? First of all, like uh, when I was looking at the literature and uh, it's, it's amazing that it's uh, like for decades, we have been dealing with this, uh, this spectrum of hemodynamic significant PDA, but there's no consensus. And all aspects of managed PDA management, if you like to say they are kind of uh, controversial, be it medical or surgical treatment, and there are lots of uh, variations, uh, not only between cardiologists and neurologists, but even in neonatal units, uh, nationally, internationally as well. So uh, first of all, let's just, uh, just look at the, the cardiologist versus the neonatologist. There's always a debate because as a cardiologist, we, we think that neonatologists are, maybe they are delaying the treatment and this and that, but I can, I can equally understand that uh, the neurologists are the primary gatekeeper and the primary managing physicians, and they have their valid reasons of what they are doing is probably is the best interest of the, of the patient. So there was like an interesting survey in 2018 between neurologists and cardiologists. And most cardiologists believed that PD closure alters the clinical outcome in infants born less than 28 weeks per station, while almost half of the neurologists uh, surveyed disagreed. And they have said probably they would like to keep a more on the conservative side. Uh, I mean, honestly, there's not enough evidence to determine whether uh, these systemic complications, which a premature neonate uh, comes across, are directly related to a hemodynamically significant PDA or not. And maybe uh, that is one of the reluctance from our neonatologist colleague uh, to be more aggressive. This is the paper which I was talking about, which is published in Congenital Heart Disease uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, I mean, I don't uh, want to go into details, but uh, there was there was significant difference between neurologists and cardiologists regarding the impact of PD closure on morbidity and mortality, with 80% responding that it does, while only half the cardiologists said probably uh, it doesn't. Anyway, uh, let's just go back to the PDA. Uh, I would just like to uh, spend some uh, time for surgical ligation, and then I'll go to the interventional aspect which is primarily uh, uh, sort of more of a uh, cardiologist's interest, to be honest. So uh, if you look at the literature, there has been a uh, uh, lot of questions about the outcome benefit, and then there are papers which, uh, which link increased morbidity, including uh, BPD, retinopathy of prematurity, and long-term neurodevelopmental impairment related to surgical ligation of the PDA. But I, I think, uh, nobody's entirely sure whether it's a purely cause and effect if surgery is an indication of clinical severity. And th uh, that's why I think most of the neonatologists uh, uh, probably, uh, as I mentioned, are more conservative when it comes to the surgical ligation unless, until unless uh, it is really indicated in their opinion. So if you look at some of the papers, this, this is one paper which mentioned about surgical ligation of PDA in preterm units weighing less than 1,500 grams, a single center experience of, uh, of nine years. 
and they, uh, their result was that the mean gestation rate and birth rate was significantly lower in the PDA ligation group, which uh, probably just tells you the severity of the disease. And uh, usually the PDA ductal diameter, low APCA scores, and chore interestingly, chorioaminitis was uh, they were the predictors for receiving surgical treatment. And I think uh, with chorioaminitis or an insepsis, probably there are some uh, biochemical reactions in, in the body which keeps the patient that this arteriosus open. And probably that's why they are more likely to have treatment failure with medications and most likely uh, are going to be a surgical candidate or in current era, uh, or maybe an international candidate. An early ligation was significantly associated with the low incidence of culture proven sepsis, mechanical ventilated time, necrotizing enterocolitis, and IVH. So, uh, I mean, there are things which are in favor of surgical ligation in, in, these, in these select group of patients. Again, uh, there's another paper which mentions about the optic of optimal timing of surgical ligation. It's a meta analysis which compared late surgical ligation with early ligation. And they think that uh, early ligation might have a better respiratory outcome and nutrition status for PDA uh, in preterm or very low birth weight infants, although there's no difference in terms of mortality. Uh, so what, uh, when you look at, the, uh, look at the data, you, you need to understand why there, is, why there is a concern about PDA surgical ligation. In terms of complications, post ligation syndrome, about 30% has been reported. Vocal cord dys uh, dysfunction on average has been uh, reported as about 30%, which is, a, which is quite a big number. Then you might have impaired neurodevelopmental outcome, risk of uh, worsening of uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, chylothorax, diaphragm paralysis, bleeding pneumothorax. So uh, lots and lots of uh, complications which has been attributed to uh, surgical ligation of PDA. Or even in longer term, there has been uh, uh, reports of thoracic scoliosis and neurosensory impairment. Uh, so if you keep all that in mind, uh, the question is, could there potentially be a better alternative? And nowadays, there are a, lot more, uh, a lot more attention has been paid to percutaneous closure of hemodynamically significant PDA. Uh, historically, uh, Transcatheter closure of PDA is something which is established in practice now, especially for children who are more than five kilograms. But uh, these boundaries have been lowered down recently during the last five years or so, and now people are uh, putting their attention towards the premature patent ductus arteriosus. It's an attractive alternative option with uh, less morbidity, morbidity and mortality as compared to surgical ligation with, with comparable results. Uh, this was a clinical trial which was done on one of the devices in, uh, in patients who, were, who weighed more than 700 grams. And uh, it's, uh, it was uh, like a multi-center study. And they have reported implant success rate of more than 95% overall and 99% in patients less than 2 kilograms. So, so quite, a, quite a good result. And if you look at the safety endpoint, uh, very few events uh, 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 happened like uh, two-day transfusion, one hemolysis, and one aortic obstruction and there was no branch pulmonary artery obstruction. So all in all, if you look at these numbers, you would say, yeah, probably uh, we should be thinking if it comes to surgical or transcatheter closure, uh, we should be putting more favor toward the transcatheter closure. Uh, this, this is another paper which uh, primarily looks at the uh, uh, transcatheter closure versus surgical ligation in a certain time period. It's not like a look, like a comparative study, but in the same time, when the transcatheter closure was done, they also looked at the surgical ligation in the same center, and they thought that the numbers were uh, more favorable in patients who underwent uh, transcatheter closure, especially time to extubation and changes in uh, respiratory severity scores. So, so their conclusion was that it is feasible in infants as small as 640 grams and can be performed safely in the majority, and it offers faster meaning of uh, respiratory support compared to surgical ligation. So uh, can we put any, any sort of uh, rough timing of closure? Uh, do we think doing it early might benefit? So again, people have tried to look at it, but there's lack of consensus on exact indication and timing. And again, uh, there is variable practice as far as the age and weight is concerned. And one can understand that not every center can, can deal with transcatheter closure and that's why people have their own hesitations. So in terms of a single center experience, early closure was associated with improved outcome, including quicker weaning of ventilatory support and improved growth. 
And those who were referred late, because uh, your pulmonary uh, circulation has been exposed to increased, uh, uh, in increased uh, blood flow for a long time, so sometimes they can develop increased uh, pulmonary artery pressure and increased pulmonary uh, vascular resistance that may make this procedure more riskier. So that's why their consensus was that probably it should uh, ideally be done before four weeks of life. Again, like any procedure, there are uh, complications which are associated with, uh, with catheterization, but definitely far less than what we get with, uh, with the surgical ligation. Most importantly, people are worried about vascular access complications. Nowadays, uh, uh, people don't uh, go for a femoral arterial access. So the risk of uh, vascular access complications is low. Then uh, obviously you can have uh, residual left pulmonary artery stenosis or aortic arch stenosis, device embolization. Uh, there are case reports where they have, uh, there was actually uh, damage to the tricuspid valve and sometimes even avulsion of inferior vena cava. But I'm sure uh, uh, as everybody has to go through the learning curve and as people are using more, uh, people are using more of this uh, procedure uh, in uh, young children, uh, probably the, the risk of these complications are going to be less and less. Again, having said that, I would like to emphasize that this is not something which everybody can do it and only very specialized people with very specialized, uh, under very specialized circumstances could be done. And uh, most uh, right now, it's primarily in North America where the major chunk of uh, this uh, intervention has been done. These are some of the devices which you can use uh, uh, for, for these. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, all of these devices are very soft and they can go through uh, smaller sheets, which makes this procedure less riskier. And as we are learning more and more about this, I'm sure that uh, uh, everything has become more refined and uh, indirectly leading to less complications. This was another meta-analysis which showed outcome of ductal device closure in less than six kgs. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can, uh, you can read it, but if you look at uh, these, uh, some, of the, some of the papers which has been published recently, uh, they have used uh, sort of different devices uh, and you see uh, the major numbers, 1, 2, 80, 154. And you lift, if you look at the number of complications, they are very few. So it, it's, it's quite an encouraging trend. What are the contraindications? Obviously, if you're suspecting aortic coarctation or left pulmonary artery stenosis, probably uh, you cannot proceed with, uh, with this kind of intervention. Also, if it's severe pulmonary hypertension or duct dependent cardiac lesions, these are contraindications. And when we talk about relative contraindications, acute sepsis, if uh, there's a requirement of high frequency oscillatory ventilation or significant hemodynamic instability. What are the challenges with this? Uh, I already talked about the technical aspects, and uh, again, it's a it's a it's a very fragile population, so only very expert people probably should should uh, tackle, and uh, not every center should be doing it. Then, one of the important challenges is transportation of these infants to the cath lab, and. For me, I think uh, one key challenge is how are you going to maintain temperature control for these patients in an environment of cath lab where usually uh, you have uh, cold temperatures in the cath lab and keeping uh, very small children, uh, normal thermic is, is an extremely difficult task. And that's why it's a teamwork with neonatology team, cardiology team, and uh, uh, anesthesia team all has to be on board before the procedure and every uh, detail should be meticulously uh, seen before embarking in this procedure. Um, I mean, this procedure may eventually, uh, there are like, uh, initially it started at bedside, but I think still probably the best thing is that this procedure should be done in the cath lab. I'll just go, you, uh, go through one of the cases which was done. This is a, a nine week old baby uh, weighing 1.1 kilogram who was, uh, initially had severe respiratory distress syndrome and was unable to be weaned from ventilation, was given a medical therapy which failed. Uh, you could see that this is a hyperdynamic left ventricle function, which is with a dilated left atrium and left ventricle. You could see there's a large quitting ductus arteriosus, which is purely shunting left to right uh, with a low velocity. So this patient was taken to the cath lab and you can see uh, th this is a this is a catheter which is going to the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, 
and uh, at the mouth of a duck, dye was injected to get an idea of the size of the duck and also the, uh, also uh, uh, the morphology of the duck. Then uh, the, uh, uh, the duck was around three millimeters, so Emplatzer duck loader additional size was chosen, which was deployed in a, in a successfully. And you could see it is, uh, it, it's, it is, uh, it is uh, nicely in place. And this is an echocardiogram. This is an uh, echocardiogram after it shows a device to be uh, nicely in position. And uh, sorry, uh, this is just a color picture. Uh, for some reason, it's not playing. Okay, and you could see this is a blue color. Uh, to at the top is a descending aorta, and this is left pulmonary artery and and laminar flow in both both the structures and the device is in well position. And it was quite a good result and patient was able to be weaned off ventilation and ultimately was discharged in good condition. So uh, this is a slide which I taken from Pediatrics, uh, which was published, uh, I think in December, 2020. And uh, this is like, like a nice slide, which uh, tells you how to uh, effectively manage a hemodynamically significant PDA. And just like if you look at when it comes to uh, if the medical therapies fail, they have de written definite ductal closure by catheter intervention or surgical ligation. So that means that this catheter intervention is becoming uh, more and more acceptable practice. Quick word about post ligation syndrome. Uh, usually, what happens is if there is a large duct and you close it, it can lead to uh, uh, myocardial dysfunction of the left ventricle. And you might come across a neonate who had a uh, ligation of the patent ductus arteriosus and then uh, presents to you with a low cardiac output syndrome, uh, maybe a few hours after ligation. So uh, they, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the incidence of post-ligation syndrome is about 30% with the surgical ligation and much lower with the transcatheter closure. And some people have advocated the use of uh, prophylactic midrinone, which does decrease the incidence of uh, post-ligation syndrome. Just one case to, to finish it off. Here you could see volume loaded uh, left side of the heart with a hyperdynamic function, indicating uh, most likely a significant uh, left right shunt, most likely uh, RPDA. This patient uh, also uh, on echo, you could see uh, a large duct, low velocity duct, which measured around 10, uh, sorry, uh, which measured around three millimeters. So this patient underwent a surgical closure of PDA. So this was the echo pre procedure and this was the echo six hours post. You could see how significantly this fun cardiac function was depressed. This left ventricle is not um, uh, moving as beautifully as it would have been expected at this stage. And then uh, this patient was started on some midrinone and vasopressor support and his clinical condition improved. And this is an echocardiogram which was done on seven days post uh, surgical ligation with recovery of uh, left ventricular function. So it just like uh, the idea of presenting this case was just to signify that uh, you need to be very careful about uh, this syndrome and uh, need to treat it uh, well in time. This was a paper which was published from our hospital about 15, 16 years ago, which mentioned about left ventricular dysfunction after closure of large patent ductus arteriosus and uh, the phenomena which I mentioned earlier uh, they, they looked at uh, uh, 43 patients and uh, the, the group which had a large ductal diameter more than 3.1 millimeter, they had significant left ventricular dysfunction after closure of uh, patent ductus arteriosus, but luckily all of them uh, recovered. So it's uh, the good thing about it is that it is a transient phenomenon. And, and if we pick it early and manage it, uh, <clears throat> manage it early, the outcome is very good. So just to finish it off, I think I'm, I'm, I'm done. So yeah, so I think it's still a challenge uh, uh, managing a hemodynamically significant PDA if medical treatment fails, what is next? But I think uh, percutaneous closure may be, I'm not saying that right now, but maybe five, 10 years down the line, it might be uh, more uh, acceptable to the, uh, uh, to the cardiologist and neonatologist and may shift the paradigm of treatment However, we need a future randomized trial regarding transcatheter closure to look at its short and long-term outcome. Uh, I think I will finish my talk here. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zahir. It was very uh, illuminating. I think we can take some questions, uh, Vikram. Okay. Yes, sir. So, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Sayadwai and Zahir. Uh, it's a very nice uh, overview. Uh, quick, a quick question, questions uh, to both of you. Uh, role of acetaminophen. You mentioned uh, Dr. Sajjad, but the thing is that is you are using in your center or not, or what is your belief on acetaminophen? Personally, I still use the ibuprofen as the first line, mm -hmm. but some of my colleagues are using paracetamol as the first line. So I don't have enough data to say that uh, that is not right either. The okay. studies have shown that paracetamol is as effective as is ibuprofen or indomethacin, but it is not superior to uh, ibuprofen or indomethacin. Yeah, and at that, the same time, FDA has not approved it. Uh, so uh, FDA, is, is no, but it is. It is my thing is that the algorithm what Zahid shows. If you go through that algorithm, and you know what is written that if you fail. Uh, by ibuprofen, okay, then consider paracetamol as a rescue treatment. So how you take yes. this thing, it means that paracetamol is more effective than uh, ibuprofen. Well, I mean, this is individual factors. There is no data or trials to, to say that this is right or wrong. I mean, these are all controversies in the management of uh, PDA. I think we have settled only in the in a few yeah. things about PDA. One is that we treat only hemodynamically significant PDA. Exactly. How do we treat it? It varies from one person to another person and one person to another person. Sure. And we don't so, have enough data to say which is hmm. more right and which is less right. Sure. So let's so, people try and we need more time. Exactly. That's fine. Uh, Zahir, well, I, I have a, one question. So how optimistic are you about percutaneous closure? So that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, if you look at the data, it is quite promising, but I mean, the challenges will still remain. Uh, as far as the technical aspect is concerned, I think uh, we, can, we can deal with it. But again, selection of patient, availability of devices, and most importantly, uh, the intra-procedure overall management of the unit. That is very important, as I mentioned about the hypothermia, uh, their ventilation or transportation. Mm -hmm. So if we can if we can deal with them effectively in a in a in a better way, I think uh, in my opinion this procedure is is quite productive and probably it should it should take off uh, because okay. uh, the good thing I I don't think that we are going to have any long term complications with sure. this procedure to be honest. Okay, uh, second there. Uh, 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 sir. Very nice presentation by Professor Sajjad and Dr. Zahir. Uh, I have very basic questions uh, because what is the timing of getting an echo done, especially in preterm babies? Especially as you have mentioned that there is a release of prostaglandin. I mean, we have shown you how, how the natural uh, process of closure works. And again, it is dependent upon the gestational age and the condition of the baby, how much is the ventilatory support and whether it is clinically, it looks like that the baby might have a significant duct opener. There's no specific time for doing the, uh, the, the echo. And it's again, it's just a clinical judgment. And uh, there are a number of factors which we have to look into together. As I said in one of my slides, that there are a lot of areas which we need to consider to say whether there is a hemodynamically significant duct or not. But again, this is a combined teamwork between the cardiologist and the neonatologist. And we together make a decision. But there is no significant, sorry, no, no specific time when should we do an experiment. Time we can not do my second question is, you have mentioned about the prophylactic and therapeutic intervention uh, regarding the closing uh, for closing of PDA. Uh, I don't understand about what is the definition of uh, uh, prophylactic uh, indication. Yeah, actually, that was an era which is now over. And I'm sure Dr. Dinath and uh, Professor Nath will agree with me and Dr. Nath. 
when I was uh, in UK as a consultant in early 2000s, the, the prophylactic indomethacine was being used routinely, which means every baby who was less than 1,000 grams and every baby who was less than uh, 28 weeks in, weeks in gestation, there was a set protocol. When he's done. He would get admitted to the NICU, he'll be intubated, he'll be ventilated, he will get a insulin, gentamicin, he will get caffeine, and he will get a dose of prophylactic indomethacine. This was a set protocol. And that was being given because uh, people thought that we can prophylactically close and uh, before it becomes hemodynamically significant and leads to more difficulties with the ventilation, we should, uh, uh, we should close it. But then we saw a lot of uh, cases of uh, NEC and IV, uh, sorry, PVR and uh, a lot of other problems. So that era is now, now over. I think uh, other colleagues can comment on Okay, uh, uh, so anybody else, uh, if any question, please raise your hand. So if not, uh, then, uh, yeah. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Arjuman. Yes, thank you. Um, I just, uh, uh, wanted to say hello to Zahid. Um, <laughs> it's been yes, a long sir, time. So obviously yes. it's been a, at least more than four years uh, we met uh, in UK. So nice presentation, both of you. Um, just, uh, just a quick comment um, on, the, um, pro, uh, on the pharmacological treatment of PDA. I think in UK, most of the centers nowadays uh, use paracetamol instead of ibuprofen. That's what their experience is. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But if you go to US, nobody's using it because it is not FDA approved. So, so who is right? This side of the Atlantic or the other side of the Atlantic, we don't know yet. That's right, yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Arjuman is here. So I, I would like to, because he's been in Pakistan now for some time. So I would like to hear his thoughts about uh, transcatheter closure or is there room for these kind of things? In Pakistan at this stage or not? Uh, I think in Pakistan, problem here is uh, if there is a, you know, for example, device embolization, I think then to deal with that preterm mm. surgically is probably is going to be 100% mortality. That's what I would mm. guess. Because mm. to take the device out is going to be extremely difficult. Mm. Um, yes, I would like to take this uh, thing up. I think probably what I would personally would like to do, not in the catheter, but actually. Uh, echo guided um, device mm -hmm. of the sure. PDA. And again, mm -hmm. you need to have the variety of the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. different types of devices. We do have, um, um, you know, the ADO2 additional sizes and uh, as well as the vascular plugs. So there is a possibility, but I have not explored the um, possibility at, at present, but yes, in future, if there are mm -hmm. any victims who are struggling as you know, in Pakistan, the surgical expertise are still, you know, it's expanding, but it's not at the yeah. to that stage yes. yet. Yes. That's, that's why I believe, I think that uh, people like you probably has a, has, a, has a role to play. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm still new to Pakistan. I'm still <laughs> trying to settle down. Uh, but I think for Pakistan, still, uh, I hope that it will at some stage. Yeah. I think for Pakistan, the best option would probably be paracetamol, easily available. Yeah. IV yeah. and oral, and IV and oral both are effective. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that first of all, we are not treating that much of PDA. Second thing, it can be treated by ibuprofen uh, orally, which is very cheap medicine, and also the paracetamol, which is easily available. So in both cases, the uh, percutaneous may be hardly needed for some uh, babies because right now, uh, you know, in a year, we are treating only uh, in Mayo and here in uh, UAE, we are treating maybe two cases in a year or th three cases, that's it. So the, the, the problem is this, that uh, for Pakistan, I think it is still very early for high fi gadgets. 
uh, and the skills, as uh, Zaheer said, this is a, you know, you have to develop the skills. So uh, I 100% agree with Dr. Sajjad that it, I think it is better to continue with the paracetamol. Dr. Shabina has a question. You as also, but not as common as ibuprofen, uh, you know. So that's that, that, that's uh, true, but there are some centers who are using uh, the acetaminophen, whether because many drugs in neonatology is not approved by the FDA. So anyway, uh, is any other question from uh, the yeah. colleagues from in Dr. Karachi? Shabin has a, Dr. Shabin has a question. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Sajjad, Dr. Zaid. Wonderful presentation. Wonderful. Thank you. A good refresher for us and uh, a lot of updates. Thank you so much. I just have a comment. So you're absolutely right, Dr. Sajjad, that there has been evolution in the pharmacological ways we treat PDA, even in Pakistan. And with a lot of NICU uh, coming up, uh, we now see more of therapeutic and prophylactic is always is gone and finished. However, we still, um, uh, in with respect to the use of ibuprofen and paracetamol, we all have our biases based on what experience we have had. My, uh, my uh, take is I feel ibuprofen works faster and gives you faster result, but that's just experiential learning. I'll give you the and uh, paracetamol somewhat uh, because of the, because what we use here is almost five days, not two days, not seven days, somewhere in the middle, we are using in our unit at AKU for five days. And we do have a retrospective data, which I will share. Um, um, again, it's it's a retrospective audit uh, of uh, the outcomes. So yes, um, paracetamol versus ibuprofen. So I was wondering, is there room uh, for an RCT or would it be ethically uh, worth doing an RCT of ibuprofen versus paracetamol? And at the same time, a cost impact analysis, especially for LMIC, and LMIC countries, because you just mentioned that probably paracetamol would be uh, the best for countries uh, like uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh and other countries where, we, where it is easily uh, available at all levels, not only private sector, uh, across the public sector. So just want to hear some uh, details from you, from Dr. Junaid and others who are on the call, Dr. Arjuman, Dr. Sayy, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, may, I, may I, I answer that question or that comment? So thank you, Dr. Shabina. I think there is a room for the uh, trial. Number one, we need more trials to prove that uh, uh, paracetamol is superior to ibuprofen. We know it is as effective as ibuprofen, but the trials have not proven its superiority yet. This is one thing. And secondly, the people are coming with new ideas. There's the combined use of ibuprofen and paracetamol. So if we give them together, maybe we give uh, shorter duration of treatment, maybe one dose of ibuprofen and two or three doses of paracetamol, and that, that would be more effective than uh, the, each one of them individually. So there are some studies, smaller studies published on that as well. But of course, we need to do a larger studies to prove that uh, strategy as well. I hope that answers your question, Shavin. There is a, some disturbance, but anyway, um, it's now almost eight thirty. So, uh, I think there is no uh, further questions. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sajjad and Dr. Uh, Zahir, thanks a lot for, to review uh, uh, extensively these um, uh, this topic of the PDA. Uh, so with that, uh, we conclude the module of uh, uh, cardiology and neonatology. And uh, inshallah, we will uh, start the new module, which is most probably the GI. So uh, stay tuned for the further information and it will come soon. Uh, from my side, this, uh, have a nice evening. I think uh, we will see you with the new module uh, next week or the week after. Uh, Vikram, you have to say anything? Uh, no, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zaid, Dr. Sajad. It was a very nice uh, discussion. And uh, we had completed almost all aspect of cardiology in neonatal uh, medicine. So we have to move to another module. So most probably it will be GI. So let's schedule it and organize it accordingly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
so thank you very much uh, we will inshallah uh, make the initial agenda for that module and we will share with all of you and thanks a lot uh, uh, dr sajad and dr zahir again and uh, professor khalid haft and dr mubaris nafi uh, all are uh, joined with that thanks a lot for attending and thanks a lot for uh, other participants thank, thank you very much, much. have a nice Salaam evening walikum assalam Salaam.